Good morning. Welcome to our webinar today. Today we're going to be talking about redaction and expungement how-tos, so cut that out. How do you redact? How do you expunge? I'm going to talk a little bit about the legal requirements for both expungements and redactions. And Kendra Yates is here to talk about the practical application of redactions. And then Avalon Snell will talk about practical application of expungements, how to organize and maintain expunged records. So with that, we'll just jump in to talk about redactions first. So the dictionary defines redaction as censoring or obscuring part of a text for legal or security purposes. So part of the text is removed or obscured. And just so you know, there is no mention of redaction in grammar. Section 63G2308 talks about segregation. So when you see segregation throughout the law, that means redaction. And so 308 says that if a governmental entity receives a request for access to a record that contains both information the requester is entitled to inspect and information that the requester is not entitled to inspect, then the governmental entity shall allow access to the information the requester is entitled to and may deny access to the information that is exempt from disclosure. So I just want to point out here, emphasize that word shall. So kind of makes redaction mandatory. You have to be able to separate the information that the requester is entitled to in order to provide that. I just want to point out in this section 308, it also says that if the information the requester is entitled to inspect is intelligible. So if after you have redacted or segregated the portion the requester is not entitled to and what's left isn't intelligible, then you would just deny access to that record as opposed to trying to segregate it. Section 202 of Grandma talks about who has access to private records. So for example, the subject, a guardian or someone with power of attorney has access or is entitled to access to private records. But if there is information about more than one subject in the record, then this says that the information about another subject must be redacted before providing the record to the requester. So if you have to spend time segregating, redacting, then you can charge for that. So section 203 talks about fees and it begins with a simple statement that a governmental entity may charge a reasonable fee to cover the actual cost for providing a record. Then further down it lists what actual costs can include. So the cost of staff time for compiling the record in an organization or media that meets the person's request other direct and administrative costs for complying with the request. Even though this doesn't specifically mention time for segregation or redaction, I think that would be included in the cost for compiling and administrative costs for complying with the request. Segregation is one of the extraordinary circumstances or actually two extraordinary circumstances. So when a governmental entity receives a records request, they have 10 business days in order to respond. And one of the responses can be that because of extraordinary circumstances, it will take more than 10 days to respond. And then the law lists eight specific extraordinary circumstances. And Two of those are 
one segregation requires extensive editing, so there's a lot of redaction to do, in other words, or segregation requires computer programming. So in these instances, the extra time that is allowed is if, uh, if there is extensive redacting, then fulfill the request within 15 days after the response time specified. Or if it is computer programming, then you would just have to complete the computer programming as soon as reasonably possible. A lot of times when there's a lot of redacting, it might also involve the extraordinary circumstance of a voluminous request. And if that's the case, then the governmental entity just completes that as soon as reasonably possible. Then section 205 talks about a notice of denial and it provides all of the elements that must be in a notice of denial and just fleshes that out. But I just want to point out that it the top of this 205, it says that if the governmental entity denies the request in whole or part, it shall provide a notice of denial to the requester. So denying a request in part would mean redacting part of it. It could, that's one of the ways to interpret this. So a notice of denial can be provided to cover the points that are redacted in a record, giving the requester the opportunity to appeal those redactions. And then section 201 talks about a person's right to inspect public records. So it begins by laying the foundation that a person has a right to inspect a public record free of charge during normal business hours. But then as, you, as it fleshes this out, it goes on to make some exceptions. And one of those exceptions is that if the record is accessible only in a computer that's owned by the governmental entity, that it's part of an electronic file that also contains private protected or controlled information that the governmental entity cannot readily segregate then in that case, the, the public portion is not available for the public to inspect in the office. That's just saying that a, a person can't come to your office and peruse a government computer if it contains private or protected information. So those are the points in grandma that talk about segregation. And so Kendra's going to take some time now to talk about implementing these concepts and how do you do it? Yeah, I think the real world implementation of the laws sometimes presents um, conflicts and dilemmas. Um, so these are some of the, see, these things listed are some of those, um, but we will get to those a little bit later. I want to first just go over the technical aspects of redacting records um, because all of the discussion about whether or not to redact something is moot if when you try to redact it, you fail. Um, a rather unfortunate case in point was broadcast in the news recently, just this last month. A KUT reporter wrote about supervision notes for five adult probation and parole offenders that she had requested from the Utah Department of Corrections. They provided her with heavily redacted versions of the supervision notes. And while discussing the records um, via email with the supervisor, she copied and pasted one of the records into the email only to discover that the redactions went away. Uh, she now was able to see exactly what corrections had chosen to redact. And this resulted in a, a kind of two-part story. The first part she dedicated to discussing what the agency had chosen to redact. And she had an expert attorney there talking about his opinion um, on what should not have been redacted that they did redact. And, and then the second part of the story, she was going over the content of the records 
and from a from a public safety viewpoint and discussing the way that the offenders have been supervised by APMP. So I don't bring this up to embarrass the Department of Corrections by any means or APMP. Um, it's the sort of thing that could happen to anyone. But it does emphasize the importance of choosing your redaction method really carefully, deliberately, and then testing it out to make sure that the redactions cannot be undone, either in the same software that you use to do the redactions or by something else entirely like a browser. Um, so when you're redacting on paper, it's pretty straightforward. You usually just take a, a black marker and mark over the top of anything you don't want showing. Um, but I have seen situations where you could, with the naked eye, tell the difference between what was um, put on there by the marker and what was printed on there. And so um, if you make a copy of it in the copier, that tends to take care of that. It turns it all a pretty flat black. But whatever you do, you just need to make sure that you check it in different lights to make sure that, uh, different lighting, to make sure you can't uh, read it. And then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, for unstructured data, this is PDFs and uh, just documents that are like on a shared network um, drive and not in a database. That's what I mean by unstructured data. So, so there is software called auto redaction software that uses op optical character recognition, which basically means that it can read, uh, and artificial intelligence tools to scan documents and, and redact them for you. Of course, you have to spend some time setting it up initially, telling it what parameters you want it to follow or what specific words um, or fields in the document. It actually can identify just the location of fields and do it that way. Um, so those are pretty slick. You can go through a lot of documents um, in a short amount of time. And in between these two options uh, is the option that I tend to use, which is using a PDF editing uh, tool that includes redaction software, has redaction capabilities. Um, and I often do one document at a time. It depends on what I'm trying to redact out. Um, but um, let me go ahead and demonstrate for you, if that's all right. So the tool I use is Adobe Acrobat Pro. I am. Okay. Let me share my screen so you can see. And I'm going to have to do an entire screen. So let's just hope that I don't do anything embarrassing. By the way, by the way, Colleen says Adobe Pro is $14.99 per month. Well worth it. Yeah, it's not it's, it's not a super expensive tool. And it's got really great um, redaction capabilities. So let's see, how's that? Can people see my screen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I only have one screen, so try it again. I think it was thinking really hard. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little tricky because I've only got the one screen that I'm dealing with. <clears throat> and in order for you to see the pop ups, you let's see. Does that work? You want me to share your entire, yeah. yeah. I said, sorry, picky. Okay, let's try that again. <clears throat> we did get this working. We tested it out, I swear. It's just not working. Okay, that's okay. I don't have to do it in the in the program. Um. So. If you would just go back to the presentation, I, I put some slides in in case it didn't work because <laughs> I swear we had it working before, but um, yeah, so let's see. Okay, so here's just an example. This is using Adobe Acrobat Pro, as I said. So um, you can do one at a time, which is what I'm showing in this screenshot. 
uh, and I just highlighted the different fields I wanted to use, or you can use the find, um, the redact text and images drop down has a, a find redaction tool. And um, I gave it instructions there, see so find text and redact, and chose patterns and email addresses. And then you can see that the window it gives you there on the left, <clears throat> it actually will list all of the fields that it found it in. So it doesn't do anything without having you verify that that's what you want it to do, which I really liked. Um, and then I clicked on mark checked results, uh, checked all the boxes, they all looked good. And so then it, it does this red rectangle <clears throat> around the field that it's going to redact. So it's very, very clear when you're reviewing it, what's going to go away. And then you click apply and, and it gives you this fun message about uh, the fact that it will remove the redacted information <laughs> and uh, and it says your document might contain hidden data and metadata do you wish to remove them too and so I always say yes because if you leave those behind you haven't really redacted the document um, someone that knows what they're doing would be able to find information <clears throat> that's private or protected so once you do that it gives you this message that once you save the document, you won't be able to retrieve the redacted docu uh, information. And then the final document looks like that. So um, I do think that this is a, a good solution. No matter what method you use, copy and paste and try and make and try to paste, copy and try and paste it into a text, some text app, um, one of which should be in a browser window just to be sure. Um, so there are other, uh, hang on, sorry. There are other um, types of records besides PDF that you might have to try and redact, but I'll be honest, I don't love um, the idea of providing something to a requester that they could continue to change to edit. So I try and provide my records in PDFs whenever possible. Um, Microsoft Word documents, um, they don't even, Microsoft stopped supporting the redaction tool that they created uh, for Word 2010 and Word 2007. Uh, but you can still find a free version of the tool out there. And they do have a tool in Word, the current version, that can delete metadata in a document. So you could use those two things combined if you absolutely had to provide the redacted document as a Word document. Um, just make sure that you can't copy and paste it into anything else. And then um, Google Docs, they don't have a redaction feature built in, but there are, there are a couple add-ons that you can use. Called, one's called Decode and one's called Doc Secrets. Um, so you, could, you just go to your add-ons bar when you're in a Google Doc and, and get that add-on. So those are some possibilities, but again, if at all possible, I would recommend just creating, converting that, saving it as a PDF, and then doing your redaction through PDFs editing software. Uh, as far as redacting data in a database, uh, work with your IT department, obviously, um, to identify and create processes for redacting specific data fields. And if you think about it, anything in a database, in order for it to be human readable, needs to be generated. There needs to be some kind of output function. So really what you're asking for is a specific customized report that contains only public information for something. Um, when it comes to video files, you will need video editing software, um, something like Adobe Premiere Pro or something that's not uh, that hefty works just great. Um, make sure you always make a copy and, and then you can, you have images uh, or you have options about how to redact images. So you could actually delete entire segments or you could blur the image. They have this really cool mosaic effect that you can use that um, you can set it to follow the, the face or whatever it is you're blurring and it will follow it through the sequence. And you, there's also ways to distort the voice um, so that you can't understand or can't tell who's speaking. 
and uh, make sure you always save save it as so that you're making a new file and then test the results um, in multiple places to make sure that no matter what software they tried to software they tried to open it and they are unable to get the redacted information back. Um, audio editing software for audio files it's very similar as, to video. Um, you could use video editing software for audio editing as well, um, but there's there's a lot of options out there for audio editing software, and and you can you can alter the pitch of the voice in something like Adobe Premiere Pro. So that's one option. You also can mute a voice, so you would still see everything, but you wouldn't hear a certain speaker um, if that is what you need to do to make it um, to obscure what you need to obscure. So. That is it for some specifics. Um, and then let's get into how to respond to the request. Some of the dilemmas that arise and just some of the questions that we get. So, so Rosemary already covered the notice of denial that you're supposed to include it, um, that it should include a description of the records, um, and some of these statements that I've got listed here and that it can be appealed within 30 days to the chief administrative officer and the CAO's name and business address, very specifically. So, so for more complicated requests, I have found that the clearest way to, to communicate to the requester what I have done as far as redactions and classifications is just to provide a full list of all of the categories of information or types of records and their classifications. Uh, in discovery terms, this is referred to as a privilege log, but I just found that it made it much easier to communicate to them what I had done if I listed everything, even the things that I was, that were public, that I was giving them. So um, usually being more detailed is better uh, as it clears up confusion. Um, the law does say that you don't, that the description should not reveal anything that's private or uh, protected, that, that if the classification itself would disclose some information to the requester that you don't want them to have because it's private or protected, that you can be a little more vague in those things if you need to be. Um, but otherwise, I would say more detailed is better. Um, and then one of the questions that, that we get is, how much redaction do I do before it becomes unreadable? And who decides what makes it unreadable, me or the requester? So, and that so, question to Rosemary. I would just say that the records officer gets to decide if it's unintelligible or not. One of the first things I dealt with was a request for a contract, and the governmental entity provided the contract and redacted everything except for the title of the contract and the page numbers at the bottom. And that was just a a lot of wasted toner and <laughs> copy. In that case, it, it really wasn't intelligible and they should have just denied access to that contract. Um, another thing that comes up often is requests for email. So if all that's left, if you're redacting the entire uh, conversation and just leaving the, the recipients and the senders and the date, you can just list that in the note that you have an email that was sent to or from someone on a particular date and that you're denying access to that rather than copying it and trying to redact. So those are my suggestions. That's a very useful tip. I would have saved a lot of time <laughs> for me if I had done that um, on some of my requests. So voice, voice distortion, I mean, in the case where you want to protect the identity of an individual, like for example, in the uh, section on protected records, you want to protect the identity of a witness or protect the identity of uh, someone not known outside of government, um, what lengths would you go to to protect that identity in a video? Yeah, I think if you've decided that their identity needs to be private, um, then that includes distorting the voice. Um, 
blurring out tattoos, uh, anything, anything really distinct to this person that could give away their identity, I think, is what you would need to redact. Not just their face. Not just their face, yeah. And not just, just the face, but you can still see the hair. And I mean, I think you would really need to, I, I, think, I think I would err on the side of caution <laughs> um, in that case, yeah. So for records that are subject to another law, do you still make redactions based on grammar? I've been getting a lot of questions about accident reports, for instance. People want to know what to do with the two laws having to do with the one record. Right. I've also gotten a lot of questions recently about accident reports. And I know that um, traffic code provides guidance, provides instructions about who has access to accident reports. And it lists who those individuals or entities are. And so you would provide the record to those. but even after doing that, you could still apply grandma and redact certain private information. For example, in the accident report, you may want to redact the uh, a driver's um, driver's license number or other information before providing it based on traffic code. Right. As long as who you're giving it to gets the information from what you give them. Right. So, and yeah. just just bear in mind it's important to follow that other law first and then apply grandma if, if that's applicable. Okay. That is helpful. So uh, yeah, what if you can't redact? <laughs> I mean we go back to the law and it says you shall redact. Yeah. You I mean those are my words, but the law says shall. So are there situations where it's not possible to redact? And if it's not possible, can you then just deny access to the whole record? What do yeah. you think, Kim? <laughs> I do have an opinion about this. Uh, I know, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> well, it's understandable. I think the records officers kind of sometimes get stuck in the tough spot of having to uh, scramble to make something happen that maybe the administrators that made decisions did not think about. Um, and and the, I think the case the where I've seen it the most is with body cam footage or dash cam footage um, record video recordings is the most common uh, I think where I have seen this that they then feel like they can't do anything to redact um, and so they they deny the re the records request I I feel very strongly that that if you have decided to create the record in this format that you have an obligation I mean the law says this too I'm not just making this up but the but that you have an obligation to manage the records that are created out of your processes. So if it's not working for you, you don't have a way to edit this, then you need to step back and stop creating video footage and reevaluate re your practices and take it up with your risk management people, your attorney, whoever, get some people on your side. And, and that's, that's how I would treat that. Until you can afford to manage the resulting records, you shouldn't be creating them. Um, and well, there's more I could say about it, but I will let it go with that. Um, that that's kind of how I feel about it. Think about why you're creating the record and whether or not you can stop creating that particular record in that particular format. So, um, so one question we also get is, do I, the records officer, do the redaction or does our attorney do the redaction? Who, who does the redaction? And can I charge the requester more money? So, oh. I'm for redaction, if, if the lawyer if the lawyer has to do it, can I charge the requester more money? Well, it's two separate questions, but I'm just throwing that out there. Well, if it is uh, attorney-client privilege, sometimes only the attorney can make a determination about what is attorney-client privilege, and so they would be the lowest paid employee who could uh, do that that particular work. There's most things, though, someone else would be able to do the redactions, I think. So. Yeah, I know when I got a request for this, it was 36 months worth of records. Um, I sat down with the attorney and looked at the records. We looked at the records together. He gave me instructions about what needed to be redacted. And I then was able to do the redaction. Uh, but because I guess there wasn't anything that I couldn't see. I guess that, that's what you're saying. If the mm -hmm. attorney's the only one that should see this information, then obviously 
uh, he or she can't hand it off to somebody else. But in this case, I was able to, to know what, what needed to be done. Um, so as far as who does the work, I think it is up to, to the agency to determine a case-by-case -case basis. As far as what you could charge the requester, I would say Graham was actually pretty specific about it. Uh, they give you a formula. It's the salary of the lowest paid employee with the skills and uh, I put ability on there, but it's necessary skill and training to perform the request. Um, so you kind of have to think about who has the, the, the tool and who has the, the know-how. Uh, and we actually, as the agency, get to decide uh, who is able to do that. So it says that part right in grandma. Uh, if I were to decide that an, that an attorney, if we decided that an attorney didn't have to do it, but we would prefer the attorney to do it, I might still consider charging at the lower rate, uh, because in this case, I don't know that you could justify the attorney having to be the one to do it, if that makes sense. Anyway, so kind of a case by case situation, as most of these are. So do you guys have any questions for us about redactions before we move on to expungement? You can put them in the chat, or you could unmute yourself and and just speak up. And just speak up, but I know that's harder for people to do. Oh, by the way, we are recording this, and we will be posting the slides on our website. And I think you'll get a, a link to them in an email afterwards as well with a, a survey. So just FYI. All right, it looks like Camille has a question for us. She said, you mentioned the denial letter for any redactions made. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, but there needs to be one. Um, so, yes. yes, if you think that the requester might challenge the redactions, if it's just a single social security number somewhere that's kind of inconsequential, then I don't think you would need to provide a notice of denial for that. But if there is anything substantial that you're denying, then you would provide a notice of denial. Yeah, they have the right to appeal, even if it is just a social security. I think they would lose that appeal, but um, yeah. So right, I mean, uh, it, it, it's you may provide a notice of denial, but if there's any chance that you think they might challenge what you're not providing, I would provide a notice of denial. Yeah. Dorian asks is if there's a specific format for the notice of denial, or is it produced by each agency? We, we don't create, we haven't created a template for notices of denial. We have the form on the archives website. Except we do have the form on the archives website. Right, and you can use that form, but you don't have to use that form. The notice of denial just has to include a description of what was denied, the legal citation upon which it was based, and the statement that they have the right to appeal to the chief administrative officer with the contact information for the chief administrative officer. And the, and the timeline. And, and it can be just an email, it can be the form. It doesn't matter what that looks like as long as it contains that information. If the form would help you, Renee's giving you a link to it right there. If the form would help you, especially if you're new uh, to this, um, then you can use that. I, right. I've usually just put the notice of denial as part of my response. Here are these records. Here's all of my explanation about what you're getting and not getting. Right, and the form lists, you know, has a table to list a number of different things that are being denied. Yeah. So you can list those out. When they get really complicated, you're looking at private and protected and, <laughs> yeah. and, something, and else. something else, and you're trying to give them multiple citations. And right. so, yeah. Great, any other questions? I think we have to move on or we're going okay. to run out of time. Okay, let's do it. So actually, uh... <laughs> so Avalon, oh, well, do you want to go ahead and start on it or do you want me to explain that Avalon's, go ahead. Avalon's portion is going to be, um, has been pre-recorded pre because she is in Cancun. She actually got the opportunity last minute to travel to Cancun and so I, I told her she needed to take advantage of that. She still prepared her segment for us. Uh, 
need to be and so go, go back to we the, are going to yeah. yeah get to that in a moment so first oh, rosemary's version yeah that's what we need okay all right so expungements we're going to talk about that for a minute and expungement code is Utah code 74 and that is not something that I deal with every day but I pick out the sections of that code that I think are most important for records officers to understand so in the beginning there is a list of definitions just like there is in grandma but the definition of expunge means to seal or otherwise restrict access to the individual's record held by an agency when the record includes a criminal investigation, detention, arrest, or conviction. So here we're talking about criminal records and we're talking about restricting access. So there is a process by which an individual receives an expungement order, and I'm not going into a lot of detail about that, but just to mention that they have to they have to apply to BCI, the Bureau of Criminal Identification. They have to get approved by BCI. They have to take that authorization to the court and go through a hearing and actually get a court order. So expungement is always based on a court order. So section 108 says that an individual who receives an order of expungement is responsible to deliver that order to all of the affected agencies. So once that individual gets that court order, then they're responsible to take it to the police department, the state archives, every place, every place else that might have been involved, that might have a record that needs to be expunged. And uh, so point six says that an order of expungement may not restrict an agency's use or dissemination of records until the agency has received a copy of the order. So even if the order exists out there, until that individual delivers that order to you, you don't have to take any action until you actually get the order. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So. Um, let's see, Dorian, they receive seven copies with a list of addressees. Yeah. If they don't mail it to those agencies, those agencies won't delete it from their records. Dorian worked in the courts for several years. Um, yeah, and I would just say a lot of, I don't think we're on that list, the state archives. And so we usually hear about expungements through the agencies they'll bring it to us and work with us to expunge records that we have here. But, but I, there's, there's nothing wrong with us hearing about it directly. So I kind of wish that we would be on that, that we were on that list. I don't think we are. Right. I don't, but we have had individuals come and bring expungement orders and knock on the door of the building and say, here it is. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. So if you guys know you have records here, you might want to tip them off. So. Okay. So, an agency receiving an expungement order shall expunge the individual's identifying information contained in the records in the agency's possession relating to the incident for which the expungement is ordered. So, I guess that's self-explanatory. It all relates to a specific incident and you would follow the order. So, unless ordered to do so in accordance with 774109, a governmental entity or official may not divulge information or, or records that have been expunged. So, there's this, you know, you can't divulge the information or divulge that you have the record even. And 774109 refers to BCI. So BCI keeps an index and maintains all expunged records and they're authorized to share records with other governmental entities. And this is not a complete list, but some examples are the Board of Pardons and Parole, POST, 
um, federal authorities if that's required under law, the Department of Commerce, and there's more. But for governmental entities that have expunged records, you can provide access to those records in these very limited circumstances, and that is to the petitioner, to the person who brought you the order, you can provide the record back if they come and ask for it. And the other situations involve civil actions. So if the law enforcement officer, if a law enforcement officer is involved in a civil action that relates specifically to the incident that was being expunged then, then it can be provided for that civil case as long as it's limited just to that case. And the same with other parties, if they're involved in civil actions that are specifically related to that case, then the expungement, the expunged record can be provided for that civil action as long as it's used exclusively for that case. And I think that is all the information that, I, I mean, there is a lot more, but that's the information in a nutshell that records officers need to know about expunged records. And we will move on to, uh, to the Avalon's recording. Avalon's recording that she prepared in advance to talk about how to manage expunged records. While Renee is getting that ready, um, we have a question. Does the petitioner need to have a new court order to view the expunged record? And Ashley. I don't think so. I would say no. Because the law didn't say anything about that? Because, I mean, this carves out the, the person who asked for the expungement could see the record. That has already been sealed. It's already, yes. Hi everyone, I'm Avalon Snell, a records and information management specialist at State Archives. And I'm just going to quickly go through some tips and tricks for managing expunged records in your office. So managing expunged records, um, expunged records need to stay as complete and intact as possible because an expungement can be reversed. Um, if you wish to keep them with their original grouping, and that is to say exactly where you had them before they were expunged, um, that is perfectly acceptable. Um, just make sure that they are kept in a manner um, where access is completely restricted and no identifying information is available for those records. Um, so also make sure that uh, you can respond to records requests without indicating that expunged records exist. So if you get a records request for records um, around those expunged records, um, you can get to them without also exposing that you have expunged records um, within your original records as well. Um, if you want to keep your expunged records um, separate from the original records or case files, um, you can also do that as well. Um, just make sure when you separate them, um, you are aware of the any retention requirements and access requirements before you remove them from your original grouping. Um, if you have a series specific retention schedule for the original records, um, with state archives, you might want to consider also creating a series specific retention schedule for the expunged records um, as well. That will just help you uh, better manage the retention um, for the expunged records uh, because they will match the not expunged records. Um, it's just to help you manage both sets since you separated the expunged from the not expunged. So retention of expunged records, um, when, whether you keep them in the original grouping or you decide to separate them out, um, expunged records still need to follow the retention schedule as if they have not been expunged. Um, it's just the access that is far more restricted um, for expunged records. It doesn't change the retention of them at all, um, the expungement. If you don't know the retention of your records before they were expunged, if say, for instance, your case files, if you do not know the retention, um, you can follow their 
general retention schedules. Um, or your agency might have a series specific retention schedule set up. Um, either way, you can look those up on our website, um, archives.utah.gov. What about records related to expunged records? Um, so information related to the expunged records need to be kept for the same amount of time as the expunged records. Okay, so for an example, the expungement order, we get a lot of questions about what to do with the expungement order. Um, it's easiest just to keep them with the case file or whatever order or whatever records had just been expunged. Um, so case files have a retention of three years to permanent. That means you have to manage the expungement order as well, either for three years to permanent, depending on what the case file is. So it may just be easier for you to put the expungement order with the original case file. That way you're managing them all together and they'll all hit disposition at the same time. So you can just either destroy them or transfer them to the archives all at the same time. Um, if you want to keep them separate, so you have your expunged records and then you'll have you know, related records or your expungement orders, we do have a general retention schedule, 1713, called Information Governance Records. Um, the retention for it is just keep until final action, um, and then it follows the exact same disposition as your expunged records. So if your expunged records come to archives, you'll also transfer the expungement order. Um, if you um, destroy the expunged records, you will also destroy the expungement order. So the choice is up to you, how you want to maintain your related records. Um, this is just a couple of suggestions on how to do it. You can either separate them or keep them with the expunged records. So access to expunged records. Always consult your attorney before acknowledging the existence of or allowing access to expunged records. So as I mentioned earlier, expungement isn't really about the change in retention, it's really about the change in access to the records. Um, in general, a requester shouldn't even know expunged records exist. Um, so once a record is expunged, you need to act as if that record it doesn't even exist. Um, so if someone does come looking for the record, that means they know that it exists. It might be the court, it might be, you know, the subject of the record, it might be an attorney, it might be other people in law enforcement. Um, so if that situation arises, always talk to your attorney about what to do. Um, you can also read the expungement order and see if it gives any access exceptions. Um, you can call us and ask us, um, but we will just turn around and tell you to ask your attorney. So when in doubt, always talk to your attorney. So now we're going to do some demonstrations, a few processes for expunging records. Now, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, this is just what we do at archives. There's no real wrong, right or wrong way to do it. Um, but remember, you do have to keep uh, the records as original as possible because an expungement can be reversed. So you don't really want to do any damage to the records. Um, so, if you have any files, like case files, um, loose paper records, what you can do is if you have said records, and here we just have some blank pages, but so you have your case file, what you can do is just put them in an envelope that seals, you'll seal up that envelope, take your expungement order, and then you'll just tape the order, and you'll seal the envelope. So what we're going to do is we're just going to seal it off, tape it closed. Should have practiced this. All right. There you go. Sealed closed. So nobody has access to it. And then you've got the expungement order on the front. 
And remember, you also want to know the retention and the disposition because once it's sealed, you can't look inside of it and know any dates or names or anything like that. So you'll write, want to write, you know, if it's a general retention schedule, you know, the GRS number and then the disposition. So say, for instance, you want to destroy it and then the date, let's say April 2022. And there you go. And then if you decided to keep it with your original records, you can just file it right back in with your original records. Or if you have um, a separate series or you just decided to keep it, all your expunged records separated, then you can put them all with your expunged records. But that's at archives how we separate or how we manage expunged records, at least loose leaf expunged records, is we seal them in an envelope. So if you have records that are in bound books, um, that's a little more difficult. But what you can do is, so for instance, you take your bound, you have your bound book. Um, what you can do is you can take something like a folder or like a manila envelope type folder. You can slide it over the page. Um, and then you can either um, tape it or staple it or bind it in a way that it can't come apart. And try not to get it onto the inside of the paper or, you know, the inside paper that has the writing on it. Because, again, you don't want to damage the original um, or, as, you know, you want to try as hard as possible not to damage the original. But keep it in a way where you can't read the expunged portion of the paper. And again, in bound books, it's a little more difficult to do this. Um, get a little more tape to put right there. But then, as you can see, you can still flip through the book. Um, but the page is completely covered by the envelope. You can even write expunged across here if you would like to, so people know why it's covered. But again, if it's in a bound book and it's covered, people will probably know why it's covered. Um, and that's how to um, do an expungement in a bound book. And when you're doing expungements, it's also important to make sure you expunge the record from anywhere it might be found. Um, so if you do have an index or a card file, um, something like that, also remove the uh, the case file or whatever kind of expunged record you have from the index as well. Um, because usually the index is the first place people go to even see if that case file even exists. So if you don't remove it from the index, you go to look it up, you say, oh yeah, this person's here. And then you go to pull the records and you see, oops, it's expunged. You have just told somebody that you do still have those records. Um, so Again, once you get the expungement order, expunge the records and then also remove it from your index or your card file as well. So what happens if you have records on microfilm? Um, apologies, I don't have any microfilm with me, otherwise I would show you as well. But a few things you can do for expunging on microfilm, um, you can splice, um, which is actually just the physical thing of you cut the records out um, of the film, and then you put the film back together. Um, so the roll is still complete. Um, you can try actually just covering it with black paper when taping over it so it'll still run through the reel. Um, and then as a very, very last resort, um, you can scratch the images off. Um, I do not recommend this. Um, only scratch if you know you still have the paper records elsewhere, because again, you need to keep them, an original copy of them, just in case the expungement is reversed. Um, so scratching really is only a last resort. And again, if you're going to expunge records, you need to make sure you remove them from the index as well. Um, and it's the same kind of method. Um, it is okay if you scratch the index out um, on microfilm um, because as long as you don't hurt the original record, Scratching from the index is okay, um, but you can follow those other methods as well when it comes to microfilm for the index.
Okay, and then electronic records. And now most of you are probably dealing with the electronic records um, and wondering how to expunge electronic records. And um, the biggest piece of advice I can give you is actually just work with your IT um, when it comes to um, what to do with expunged electronic records. Um, because you probably have them in a database. So always work with IT before you go removing, deleting, cutting, redacting, anything like that um, with records from the database. So make sure you talk to IT about that. Um, but if possible, move the expunged records um, to a secure folder, uh, drive, whether that's external or on the cloud, um, or move them to a server, a separate server, um, something like that. So access to them is limited because access is the key to expunged records is you don't want anyone else knowing that they exist or to get into them. Um, if you can't move the records, see if it's possible to remove the personal uh, identifying information from the records. However, before you do this, make sure you make a copy of this to maintain an original. And then you can put the original again on a secure um, drive or server or in a secure folder or something like that. Um, that's away from all of the original records. I guess because you, you need an original in case the expungement is reversed. Um, so uh, if you can't move it, see if you can remove uh, the personal identifying information. And then again, if it's in a database, um, Talk to your IT to see if there are ways to um, remove the expunged records or move them into a separate portion of the database. Okay, so just a quick summary of what we went through. I know it was a very quick tips and tricks, um, but expungement is about access. Um, so you need to make sure that nobody can access the records or even know that they exist. Um, they need to be maintained as well as any related records um, relate or any related records to the expunged records um, according to a retention schedule um, expunged records need to stay as intact and as original as possible because expungements can be reversed and if you have questions at all always consult with your attorney um, about expunged records And you're also free to contact your RIM specialist. Um, I know there's a lot of information on this slide, but it's just because your RIM specialist has specialties. Um, they're agencies that we work with specifically. Um, so we get to know you a lot better and we get to know your specific records. Um, so I'm Avalon Snell. Uh, I do state and local agencies. Um, you can see my agencies listed there. Renee Wilson does state agencies, Heidi Steed does a local agencies, and Matt Pierce also does state agencies. Um, and you'll also see Rosemary Cundiff's uh, contact information. She's the grandma ombudsman, and Kendra Yates' contact information. She's our chief records officer. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you to Avalon for joining us from Cancun. Uh, I hope she's on a sunny beach somewhere. Uh, we're, we're at time. If anyone has questions and wants to stick around, we are happy to stay and answer. Um, I just want to remind everyone of the RIM webinar next week, which is Rosemary and Paul uh, Tonks, our attorney. They will be discussing the changes to the, the, the laws this last year, anything that affects records, um, OPMA or records management in any way. And then the next two weeks after that, Rebecca Shaw will be uh, presenting to records officers and then to chief administrative officers and attorneys about grandma, handling grandma appeals and SRC appeals. So that we have those next three to look forward to. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll stick around in case there are questions.